you went down. But we have a an incredible guest, Ed McCaffrey, Coach McCaffrey, CMC's father, my very first action figure as a kid. Uh, let's give it up for Ed McCaffrey. Let's go, Ed. Let's go. Oh, yeah. for himself. That's a selfless guy. Yeah. Selfless guy. Um, first question. First question. Who's your favorite kid? Of oh, all of them. Man. You know, it, it, <laughs> ah, nice. it, varies, yeah. it varies by the day. My wife and I joke around about it. Um, it's whoever happens to call us back the quickest on that particular day. Really? Oh, so you're yeah. kind of like Dion. Or, or whoever's got something pretty important coming up. So last week it was Luke, my youngest yeah. son. He's played in the senior bowls, getting ready for the combine. This week, uh, Christian's got a pretty good game uh, yeah. coming up here, right? Who's so consistently kind of at the top of the charts? You know, it varies, man. It varies. You know, obviously you love all your kids the same, but there's some that you're more happy with in any particular point in time. <laughs> yeah. And so right now they've, they're all good. They're yeah. All yeah, they're all on the good list right now. You got to love that, dude. It's got to be hard juggling those three yeah. kids at all well, times. You got, got four, right? You got four brothers. Max is the oldest. Damn it. Then you got Christian. Well, I was trying to follow your math. Five plus eight is 13. And now I thought maybe there's something to your math with <laughs> do you three want, kids. But, do you want to hear uh, that? You know, occasionally, I, I have forgotten one of my kids in the past. I accidentally mean, left him in the car for a couple of seconds, forgetting they were falling <laughs> asleep in the, the car seat. Lost him in a store one time. So, hey, you know, all is forgiven. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. How, do you know why they, we were talking about the number 13? Uh, Cause that's how many years I played in the NFL. Of course, it's not about me. No, yeah. what thirteen? Nice. That's, that's a, that's nice a, little, that's a yeah. good reference for it. Dan so, Marino, Brock Purdy's number. What are we talking? I'm trying yeah, to follow this math. So the whole conspiracy. Obviously, you know Taylor Swift. You know uh, she is dating somebody on the opposing team that you're. I'm aware of against. it. I've been. Yeah, yeah I've heard so, reports. The Swifties have like come up with this crazy conspiracy theory that Taylor Swift's favorite number, well, they should they know her favorite number is 13. Right. And obviously Super Bowl 58, 5 plus 8 is 13, 49ers, 4 plus 9 is 13. Wow. 40, 49ers are the one, uh, one seed, Chiefs are the three seed, 13. Uh, Taylor Swift, if she goes to the game, it'll be her 13th appearance at a Chiefs game. If she makes it back from Tokyo to Vegas for the Super Bowl, it's roughly a 13-hour flight. Right. So it's kind of right. A lot well, of things are stacked was, up against there, your son. Was right there now. a movie? I don't think it was thirteen. Was it twenty three with Jim Carrey? Remember that? Uh, there was a movie where they started connecting the dots. It's like, well, you know, twelve, and then ate one bagel, and that's thirteen. And they just started making all these random connections that mean absolutely nothing. Yeah, but I like. But, but, but it's fun to talk it means about. Nothing? The thirteen killer nothing. is wearing a Niners. Well, I know a lot of hotels don't have a thirteenth floor. That's true. Right. Which is odd too, because really, you know. You know, yeah. if you go one level, you know there's above a thirteenth the floor. floor. Yes, they use it for storage or something. Yeah, it's there. It's a whole. It's a whole thing. Have yeah. you? Um, what's your thought process on Taylor Swift right now? Are you anti Taylor Swift because of the week? <sighs> you know, my wife is like her biggest fan, and she nobody has supported her relationship with Travis Kelsey more than my wife <laughs> defending defending <laughs> her and Travis to people who are the football people that don't want to mix entertainment and football. I'm like, look, football is entertainment. It's live entertainment. It's real. But it, you know, the, those two worlds have collided and it, there's no going back. And it looks like they're happy and healthy. Like I'm on in Andy Reid's camp when it comes to that. They're happy and healthy. More power to them. But Lisa has so many Taylor Swift songs on her uh, playlist when she goes jogging every day and actually bought a, this piece of artwork from Steven Wilson, this really cool artist that she likes. That is a whole Taylor Swift piece of art that hangs in our piano room. But you know, not listening to as much music this week. I'm going to put it on the kibosh for about yeah. a week. Is your, is your wife And aware? then we'll go right back to listening to it. Look, she's one of the greatest artists in the world. She puts together. Yeah. Put a, she put puts a great. Week band. She's great for the end. One week band. Is that too much to ask? Is that wrong? If you no, ask a Swifty it, fan, I bet you they say yes. Is it okay? I, is yeah. your wife aware that the government kind of set up their relationship? She is not aware. She is not. She is not aware of that conspiracy yeah, theory. You, you know? guys are into the conspiracy theories, so huh? it's just all about the conspiracy. Yeah. Conspiracy theories, like the whole idea behind them, like people who truly buy in. And it's like there's lizard people down in the sewers of Washington D.C. Yeah. To me, I'm not like subscribing to that. I'm not like buying in, buying the T-shirts, but I do love the conversation. I well, love I, the idea of being yeah. like JFK. Bigfoot. In, inside. Bigfoot. 9-11 was an inside job. It's like, oh my God, like, let's dive into this a little bit. I love to hear people passionately tell me why this is a real thing and then low-key buy it towards the end. I think I saw one of those lizard people in a, a field trip I took in eighth grade. So there may be truth to that one. <laughs> well, you live Haven't in Colorado, heard about 13. Right? Yeah, live in Colorado. Oh, the, you go, have you walked through the airport? Oh, yes. Through DIA in Colorado? They brag about it. They got really little weird sculptures and signs all I mean, over the, the place. Airport's a little, it's kind of shaped like a whale. There's talk about underground it's a facilities. I mean, there's, there's, there's like the conspiracy because they have all that land surrounding the airport. Yeah. What do they do out there? Billionaires, a bunch of billionaires own real estate out there, and it's said that they have bunkers in that area. It's pretty bizarre when you start to look at some of the artwork and some of the signs, and they kind of have embraced it. We got our evil blue horse with the red eyes outside the airport. Have you seen that thing? Yeah. It's kind of cool, but you know, like, hey, is there something to it or not? Maybe they're like just trying to be so obvious about it, but it really exists. I don't know. As a, as an athlete, 
growing up, you have the 13 year career that you have. Like when you're younger and you talk about, you know, I want to have sons. I want them to be like me. I want them to be athletes. And now it's transpired. CMC, we know what he's doing. You just mentioned Luke being at the senior bowl, getting ready for the combine. You have to be, you have to feel yeah. good, fully grown, knowing that your offspring <laughs> are basically yeah. succeeding your journey. Yeah. You know, as a parent, you know, you want your kids to be happy and healthy. And it, whether they play football or do anything else. Uh, you want them to be happy and healthy, chase their dreams. It just so happens all four of our boys ended up playing football. And it's been Christian's dream to play in the NFL and then eventually play in a Super Bowl his whole life. So as a parent, whether your kid's a musician or an artist or they're into they're an engineer or whatever they do, right? You just want them to be happy. And so I'm happy because he's happy. It seems like that's a very well-polished PC answer yeah. that you would give to anybody who's having kids. Hey, as long as they're happy and healthy, they can do whatever they want. But based on our conversation with Christian, it seemed like it was football or nothing. Really? In the McCaffrey yeah, household. You heard so the story. Yeah, probably. It so wasn't football or nothing. No, look, we always... The Gene story? We, we, we always ask them to... Oh, we, yeah. We, I don't even know if I've heard this one, but whatever they're doing, be the best at that. Mm -hmm. Right? We're, we're big in like, you are what you do. Right? And if you do something, you are how you do it. So if you're going to do something, do it to the best of your ability. So we've always emphasized that, but it didn't have to be football. It could have been anything. Like there was a couple of times where maybe they wanted to take a, a season off of not playing a sport. And we're like, great, get a job. I don't care what you do. Get a job. Join the chess club. I, I don't Anything you want to do. But you're not just going to sit around doing nothing. So, you know, you are what you do. Go do something. And when you do it, be the best you can. And when you play a team sport, no matter what it is, you've got other people that are dependent on you. And I think those are good lessons when you're young. Yeah, but the, the, the approach of which... I mean, Christian, he did bring up, you get you get tackled by your jersey. Grounded. Grounded. That's player no safety. No sodas. No that's sodas that's in the player house. safety. <laughs> that's that's, that's player safety. Told the stories, safety. He told the stories of you walking out in the woods and finding a crushed soda can and coming back and be like, hey, what do we got here? <laughs> what do, what <laughs> I'm sure everything's been embellished, man. My kids tell stories about me. I don't know how much of it's true or not. I hope most of it is not true. But um, <laughs> look, you know, it's like, hey, the carbonation while you're playing and sugary drinks. You know, just limit them during the season or before you play a game. Uh, tape in the jersey, like horse collar used to be a thing. There was no horse collar. That was just a tackle. People used to grab you by your jersey and drop on the back of your legs. That's a dangerous play. They outlawed it in the NFL, right? They're even talking about having that drop tackle. Outlawed. Hip drop, yeah. Hip drop, right? So for me, it was player safety. I saw a kid in Little League um, get hurt pretty bad. Someone grabbed the back of his jersey and then body dropped on the back of his legs, broke the kid's leg, and I'm like... I don't want that happening to my kid. You know what? From now on, you're going to have your jersey taped down. You will never get jersey tackled. Mm -hmm. And if you ever do, you know, you're going to hear about it from me. But I'm the one taping it. Grounded. Do you ever do you ever get your jerseys taped? You got them taped, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. Right? So yeah, you know absolutely. the advantage of having your jersey taped. And at linemen, you don't want guys grabbing you and you don't want get, to get beat. Mm -hmm. But when you're a running back or a ball carrier, you don't want to get grabbed and tackled from behind and potentially hurt. But if you've ever watch your equipment manager have to tape your pads for you. I hope you thanked him because it's a thankless job. It is not fun two-way tape in a jersey. And I did it for all four of my boys all the time. So did but you ever? I, 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 think, I swear to you, scored many more touchdowns because of that because I countless clips of people trying to grab for the jersey and slipping off. You're the reason for their success. Not at all. Did you ever? No, but I, I was the reason they didn't get jersey tackled. <laughs> yeah, did they, did they ever get grounded for getting jersey tackled? Um, I think Christian did once. <laughs> yeah. Or at least seriously reprimanded. And then he told, seriously reprimanded he told in the, the car ride home, no AC well, during the summer, and it, no speaking. Yeah, windows rolled up. It was one of those like once we got in the car, I didn't have to say anything. He already knew, right? Yeah. There was a couple. I didn't even say a word. We just drove home in silence. <laughs> that's, <laughs> hey, that's such a that's a good dad. Yeah, yeah. you know that's him a as, dad. as a dad too. Like oh. if they played baseball, it's like hey, no swimming on game day. Yeah, you have all those little things you're not allowed to do. And you so. I mean, obviously, you played 13 years in the NFL. You were known for being like one of the greatest blocking wide receivers of all time, a tough guy that Thank would you. lay out over the middle, make acrobatic catches. When you start having sons, is there, a, is there like a, a thought process of like, do I, I need to instill this type of toughness in them or did they come out of the womb? fighting well luckily i think that was just their their mentality early on they were serious competitors they competed with each other i think it's good to have four brothers in the same house so they compete with each other they compete with their friends and then in games yeah they were super competitive lisa my wife super competitive she was an athlete and you know it just again it's just if you're going to do something be the best you can at it right why why go through the motions and so um they were always kind of wired that way it was expected of them but i really never had to nudge them too much in terms of being competitive there was never a moment they like stubbed their and you should be like, come on, man. You're better than this. They're crying. No. I, 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 when they're I have a six-year-old daughter, and she stubs her toe, and I have that feeling. I'm like, yeah. come on, dude. You're, look at it. It's fine. And I don't say that out yeah. loud, but I feel it internally. 
<laughs> I take it. I, get, I, I stubbed it. my toe in my hotel room on the table, and I thought <laughs> it broke my toe, and I was giving myself that talk. Yeah. Yeah, dude, it's all right. You've yeah, played in the NFL. Person. You're tougher than this. Stop yeah. whining over your stubbed toe. Mm-hmm. But I think I might have broke it for real. Um, <laughs> right now? You have a broken toe right now? It could now? be broken. Yeah. I don't. You know, you, you walk it off, man. Got to watch what you do. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt this episode to bring you a ad read, and that ad read is Twisted Tea. Twisted Tea is refreshing hard iced tea made with real brewed tea. That is 5% alcohol, full of flavor and very refreshing. Twisted Tea goes down smooth, and there is no carbonation, which makes it easy to drink all day long. Twisted Tea feels fun, celebrates extreme fandom on game day, especially during the playoffs and now that this is being filmed before the big game, after the big game as well. Just because football season ended doesn't mean you can't have a nice little twisted tea in your mouth. Twisted tea is a perfect per- perfect alcohol beverage for game day, whether tailgating in a parking lot, watching at a bar, or watching with friends at home. Dude, twisted tea is there to turn up your game day. Keep that thing twisted. Grab a refreshing twisted tea today. With that being said, please subscribe, tell a friend, be a friend. In the opposite words, back to the episode. Did you actually go and pick up would you go and pick up Christian and your boys like during school to get, for them to get an IV? Yeah, a lot's been made about this whole IV thing. Um, yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, but not every not every game. So I did it for night games. So the first high school game they played at night, right? Can you guys remember back in high school? It wasn't that long ago, right? You got to actually go to class. Right. Like you're up at like six in the morning. You're lucky to eat something before you leave the house. You're on your feet all day. You're eating cafeteria lunch. Then you got another three, four hours. And then you don't come home after school. You really don't have a a proper dinner. And you're on your feet all day going to class and walking around. Like, can you imagine the NFL? Like, hey, put in eight hours and then let's go play the game. No, we we don't do that, right? We're in the NFL. It's all about ball. So at night, a lot of the kids on the team would cramp up. Like they're playing under the lights. They've been on their feet all day. And uh, they're dehydrated. They didn't eat or drink properly. And so, uh, you know, Christian cramped in the first night game he played in. I'm like, all right, you know, you're dehydrated. I'd like to think you drink enough fluids throughout the day, but it's hard to do. And he's, he like, you know, he's in on offense, on defense, on special teams. He didn't come off the field. So he's one of those guys. It's not like you're playing 50 snaps. You might be playing 115 snaps. And in the beginning of the summer, it's hot. I mean, in the beginning of the school year, right in August, it's, you know, 90 degrees or 80 some degrees. And so, yeah, when he cramped up, I'm like, you know, let's get an IV. You won't. And he never cramped up ever again after getting (laughs) IVs. You're welcome. I will say this. Hey, we, you got to love the philosophy, we, uh, dude. We, we did Just have handle it internally, like sat in a room by himself and like, all right, this is what we got to do. Yeah. We, we did have one bad experience where I, I regretted my decision to get him an IV. It was a before a state championship game. And I'm like, you know, by, by this time, you know how it is. If you think it works, it works. Right. Yeah. But, yeah. but I think IVs do work. But this wasn't a night game. It was like an afternoon game. Probably didn't need the IV. But he's like, are we going to get an IV? I'm like, yeah, we're getting the IV. I'm like, he's going to be locked in, right? He's going to feel like Superman getting this IV with electrolytes. It's just a basic, you know, saline solution, electrolytes, whatever. No big deal. But our doctor that we went to was out of town. So I'm like, you know, they got IV places all over the place. We just went to like a uh, strip mall, like outside IV place. And like, this place will do. How hard is it to give an IV, right? It's not too difficult. So we go in there, no problem. We'll set him up. We'll get him the IV. I'm kind of on my phone texting. He's like, hey, dad. Dad, I look over. He's got like a softball sized lump in his arm. Went through the vein? Well, they didn't hit the vein at all. They were pumping saline underneath his skin and it was just swelling up. No. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I call the nurse practitioner and she comes in and she says, oh, it's okay. It's just solution and starts pressing down on it to get it to go away. And so my heart rate is up a little bit because I'm like, we got a game in a few hours. Like, this is the day of the state championship. She's like, not, I'll try like, I'll try it again. Right. I'll try it again. I'm like, I'm a little nervous because I'm like, I don't know these people. And, you know, it's an outdoor strip mall. I don't know how it shouldn't be that hard. Um, So she tries it again. And, dude, she hits a vein and blood literally splattered up to the ceiling. There's blood splattering everywhere. And I'm having a panic attack now. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, he's going to be low on blood and forget the IV. Like, he's losing blood. It splattered all the way up to the ceiling. And the look on his eyes was just sheer shock. Like, what just happened? So I'm like, we're good. We're good. You know, let's. Let's just go. So, you know, he's still got this lump that's slowly going down. You got blood on the ceiling. I'm like, oh my, it's like we have a game in a couple hours. So we're out of here. So we leave, didn't get the IV. And Christian makes fun of me because he's like a believer in me, right? He's like, dad got me the IVs. This is going to help me. And we get in the car and he's like, well, are we going to go somewhere else for the IV? And I'm like, no, dude, it's, it's really all in your mind. It's overrated. Just drink a lot of Gatorade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, everything dad yeah. said for the last six yeah, months yeah, is a yeah, sham. Yeah, it's not drink, a real drink a lot of Gatorade, dude. Yeah. You'll be fine. That you know? is incredible. Or drink a lot of body armor, actually, is what you should be doing. Yeah, yeah, a lot yeah, of body hey, armor. Nice this stuff, by the way, zero. No, this stuff is delicious. I love body armor. Do you? Uh, 
uh, you still follow like a lot of like health things and you kind of dive into like the biohacking world at all? Um, I wouldn't say biohacking, but I, I do get my blood levels tested every year and I uh, want to make sure that you know, my hormones are balanced and my blood levels are balanced. And also, you know, you get in your fifties guys, you guys are still so young, man. I love hanging out with Christian's friends, by the way, this is cool. Um, <laughs> but, dude, man, this is awesome. but, uh, but you know, you get older, unfortunately, I don't have all my friends with me, man. Some of it. So early detection is important. Getting yourself tested is important and feeling good, man. Live healthy as long as you can. Mm -hmm. You know, you guys have heard the horror stories about former football players and mm -hmm. all the difficult physical challenges they have. And so, yeah, man, get tested often and early and do everything you can to feel good. Was it when you were, when you talk about like, you know, guys who stopped playing football and they kind of go downhill a little bit, but like when you played like a lot of the rules have changed since then. A lot, of, like a lot of bigger hits and stuff. Was there ever a point where you started seeing maybe some of your former teammates going downhill? Where you're like, I got to make sure I can do everything I possibly can to not for this you not know, to happen to me. Absolutely. And so obviously, you, know, you hear all the talk about head trauma. I think a lot of athletes also. You know, the rules are different. They protect players a little bit better, but it's still a collision sport. You know that, right? Um, you know, there's drug and alcohol abuse. There's depression. There's all kind of things that uh, former players go through once they retire. I think uh, today's players are so much better educated. They've heard the stories of players that came before them. They understand how important it is to take care of the body. You're looking in phenomenal shape, man. How much weight have you lost? I've lost 60 pounds. 60 pounds, right? And so all the linemen I played with on our teams lost a bunch of weight and got in shape. Not all of them. Not all of them are with us, but a lot of them got in shape. They knew that, look, I got to lose weight and be at a healthy weight and feel good. I want to feel good moving around. I want to be healthy and I want to live a long time. Mm -hmm. So you, you're proactive about it, right? Not everyone is. Some, some people, you know, it's drugs, alcohol, it's eating too much food, getting overweight, and just being overweight alone causes a lot of problems. Um, but I think today's athletes understand it. I think they do a better job, especially linemen, at taking care of themselves once they retire. Yeah, it's unique with offensive linemen. It seems like every yeah. offensive lineman kind of goes this way. And then like the running backs and receivers and corners keep eating the same way. And it's kind of true. Like, it flips a little bit, right? Yeah. yeah. And so were, so were you a weight gainer or a weight loser? I was I, I was a weight gain guy always. You like always had first, to gain weight. My first weigh-in at Michigan, I was 254 pounds. Oh, They're like, wow. hey, you're redshirting because yeah. you, had, you had all the weight. And I would do, you know, wake up 3 a.m., have like pasta, like a chicken Alfredo from like a pizza hut. Yeah. And like scarf that oh. down and go do a workout at 6 a.m., throw that up. And then they're just like shoveling food in me over and over again. So when I did inevitably stop playing, it became like, oh, okay, this is easy. I'll just start shedding the weight. And it, it came off relatively fast. Yeah. We always, I have that argument with a lot of different people. My brother was a kid who was real skinny and he was a basketball player and he always had to gain weight. And he's like, dude, it's so much harder to gain weight than to lose weight. And I'm like, I think it's harder to lose weight because I was like 238 in high school and had to lose weight to play receiver. Even going into the NFL, probably played at 220, 222. So I was constantly trying to lose weight. And so for me, I always thought it was harder to lose weight, but it's a, it's a healthy debate in the NFL to be elite at your position. You need to be at least within a range. So yeah. some guys have to gain, some have to lose, but I think the ones that end up healthier were the, the lighter ones that had to gain, even though it's hard to do for you, you gain, gain the weight. It's easier to shed it. Cause you see some guys gain a hundred pounds mm -hmm. and you're right. I see, I know DBs and receivers that put on a yeah, like hundred pounds. They don't yeah, even look yeah. like the one, same person. It's just not healthy. Yeah. How, one how, guy that comes to my mind is, uh, you know, you remember Denard Robinson yeah. from Michigan? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know, we're looking a little thick now. I'll, I'll call Denard. I love my boy. I love Denard, yeah. but you know, he's, well, I feel and I I feel this pain, man, because I um you know I'm, I need to be lighter than I am, but at one point I was way you know thirty pounds heavier than this, and I'm thinking, uh, you know, I don't feel good moving around. Um, mm -hmm. It's harder to work out, and you just know it's not it's not healthy. You put yourself at risk of so many different illnesses and diseases and like I want to be around I'm watching my kids play ball I'm watching yeah. you know I mean, my wife is in great shape and energetic I mean I got to keep up keep up You're I, wanna, with I want to be around for yeah, the, yeah. you got juice camera. man I get, I'm still hanging here? out with my son's friends yeah, yeah. just yeah. chilling on the, the most which, comfortable bus I've ever yeah. sat in over here which way uh, which way is Terrell Davis went he's in great shape really you seen him lately no oh TD Did yeah I ran into him in Colorado yeah oddly enough I was walking across the street and he like sped his car up and hunked the horn. I thought I was going to get hit. It was just TD messing with me. Yeah. Just saw him in the middle of the street. Screaming out white lightning. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and then I, you know, I cleared some traffic for him like I took pride in doing when he was playing. But no, he's chiseled. Dude, how about his, the way he started in the league? Like, the, like kickoff, right? Like special teams. I was there, man. He was like the sixth string running back. And uh, I felt sorry for him. I didn't really know him. Like there's this backup. He was a 
late round draft pick out of Georgia, and he was sixth string. And they were, you know, back then, if you were a scout team running back, that's the worst job in football. <laughs> like, here's the first string defense. We're going to practice our stuff, and let's put the third string line in in training camp and run our sixth string running back behind him on every play. He was getting tattooed, like just annihilated. And if he does well, it's like, no, come back, run it again. Yeah. Oh, no. It's, what are we it's, doing, boys? we got to get this gap this way. Run it's, it back. it's all set up for the defense. So I, I didn't even know him, and I felt sorry for him. Mm. And then one by one, kind of like your story, right? guys start going down, guys start getting hurt. We were in J Tokyo, Japan, um, playing the 49ers, and uh, he almost left. If he spoke Japanese, he would have left. But he went down to the lobby, tried to ask for a cab. Um, they weren't understanding what he was trying to say. He's like, okay, forget about it. He was going to leave. He was literally going to leave Tokyo. He's like, with six string, he's getting killed in practice. He's like, I'm not going to make the team. There's no way. And then he made that play on special teams. I think something clicked. He's like, look, I don't care. I mean, I'm just going to hit somebody. Flew down on the kickoff team, blew somebody up. Next thing you know, a couple guys go down. He's the starter. He's a Hall of Fame running back. But he was that close to leaving the team. That close. That's that a is, wild story. Yeah, I've never heard that part of it. Have you seen the play? No, I haven't. He just, I, haven't the play. I mean, he just folds this dude, flies, and then like if you do, whether it's the NFL films or something out there that like kind of talks about it or his story. Maybe it's a football life. I don't know if he has one, but uh, everybody's like, you know, turn their head like, yo, who was that? Was that uh, Terrell Davis? Like, who's that kid? Yeah, and then he, yeah, freaking goes that was like on. his He's like, like the, man. the start of his whole thing. Yeah, the origin story. Back when you could get like the, you know, you could do like big running starts on kickoff, right? Oh yeah. Like yeah, not even a, now you got to stand I there. That it was, was five uh, yards, and that one might have been like ten, right? Yeah, we got you could, you could get more than that. You could <laughs> go back as far as you wanted, but usually you were ten just to time it up, right? Yeah. But uh, that was like a whole training camp worth of just anger and and pain and hostility that he took out on that one play, which really changed the course. I think he would have been great no matter what, but for the Broncos, it changed the course of his career. Wasn't Shannon Sharp a similar story? Like he had to play special teams a whole bunch. Shannon was a really good tight end. He was already an all-pro tight end when I got to the Broncos. Mm -hmm. So I know, was he undrafted or late-round pick? He was a late-round pick, was, but I thought he was like a core four guy. He, he didn't make his hay that way yeah. in the beginning. He definitely didn't get fat. He, he no. might have. Have you no, seen he, him? I just saw him today, man. He got bigger and stronger than he was when he played. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, he's in. He's Modern a, medicine, man. And, and, <laughs> yeah. You know, you, I like to try to make it, oh, I'm getting older. I try to make excuses for not being in better shape than I see Shannon. I'm like, oh, you're killing me, dude. Yeah. You're killing me. Yeah. That dude. We were at a party he, he's last Super Bowl. He's always been that way. Yeah, we were at a yeah party seventh, last round, Super seventh round pick. Yeah. We were at a party last Super Bowl, and he was there. And obviously, Shannon, he's a, he's a fantastic personality. He's crushing life on so many different platforms right now, but... He was at that party, and he's wearing a shirt that he knows is a size too small for him. And he looked – you kind of just stared at him like, bro, you look amazing. Like, he's an action figure. Yeah. He literally looks like an yeah. action figure. It's it's How fun was he to be around a training uh, camp? You see the stuff with the Ravens, but I'm sure he, he just has that personality. He was so fun. It's like you guys. You guys are naturals on the podcast. Like when he's out there talking, that's him. He was that way in the locker room. He was always cracking jokes, making fun of people's clothes and uh, having fun. And, you know, I was always more serious guy, but I loved Shannon. And we had this guy, Keith Burns, and they'd play off each other a little bit and crack jokes. And it just lightens up the whole mood and makes us makes it a little more fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We interrupt this episode to bring you game time. Listen to me, dude. You shouldn't have to worry about buying your tickets for the next big, big event, dude. Game time is fast and easy to buy tickets for all sporting events, music, comedy, theaters, and events near you, dude. Anytime. When I live in, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm thinking to myself, I got a Saturday free. I want to go see a concert. Who's playing at Bridgestone? Who's playing at the Ryman? Is there anything going on at Nissan Stadium? Let your boy get in there. I'm going to use the Game Time app. That's the easiest way to do it. You get last minute tickets, flash deals, zone deals, easy to find and buy your tickets for every kind of event in your area. Game Time has a deal. Listen up very closely. Game Time has deals on tickets right to the start of the event and even an hour after it starts. It's the place to find last minute tickets. And right now, if you're going to the big game, which has already passed, but if you're going to a game that you would consider big, they have a great offer for $100 off your ticket with code BARSTOOL100. You can use that $100 to get some snacks, ice cold beer, maybe a giant foam finger, anything you boys would like. This offer is valid and new and wait valid for new and returning users so if you, you've already have it guess what you get another hundred dollars right there so get your big game tickets on game time now with code barstool that's b-a-r-s-t-o-o-l 100 there's more there's more right here so just take a second boys Take the guesswork out by buying your Bay Game tickets with Game Time. Use code Barstool100 for $100 off your ticket for any Bay Game. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, and that is a guarantee. Back to the episode. As um, 
let's just say hypothetically the 49ers win the Super Bowl. Yeah. How long do you wait until you tell your son you have two more than him? Oh, I will never say that. You know, I never, you know, I'll be so happy first off if that happens. Mm -hmm. I will be the happiest person on the planet. I might be happier than Christian for him and for the 49ers. This, you know, obviously I love Christian. He's my son. This has been a dream of his. But also this team feels like family to me. There's connections with the coaches and the general manager that goes back into my college days. So this that would be incredible. But um, I never, you know, having played football in, in Denver, and uh, with my kids playing football, I don't have any Lombardi trophies. My, my rings were in safety deposit box. And I never wanted them to have to think uh, that's what I need to be able to do to, that's cool. to be successful. Yeah. And, and it doesn't mean that's the right or wrong answer. I'm just like, whatever they do, it's their experience. It's not about me. It's about them. I'm here to love them and support them. If they, if they have football questions for me, I'll help them as much as I can. Get them with the IVs, tape up their jersey. Why are you wearing? Why are you wearing jeans but at it, school? Yeah, wearing some yeah, sweatpants. But it's, exactly, but it's re, but it's really about weights in the socks. So when they weigh in, they're, they're yeah, yeah, a little bit more. I interjected a little bit, but but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but on the field, it, you know, it was their experience. So I wanted them to feel that way, and I didn't want to set these ridiculous expectations. And not that it would have mattered, I think, because I think they have high expectations for themselves. But um, you know, now I'm older. I'm like, yeah, I hope you do win, so I can maybe put up one of those. Be proud to have one of those yeah, trophies man. in my office yeah. one day. How awesome! Like you alluded to it, like the 49ers feels like family, a lot of connections. Like John Lynch, the Shanahan's, you guys. Like it has to be just surreal that it's your son. Coach Mike Shanahan's son, your you know your former teammate in John Lynch, like you guys are all kind of rocking the same team. Like how how sick is that? Boys are back together. Yeah, yeah, man. No, I just have so much respect for those guys you just mentioned. I mean, they are the real deal, right? I mean, John Lynch was a teammate of mine at Stanford. He was played quarterback. I caught passes from him, and he was the real deal going back that far before he switched to safety. How far off? How different the difference in like age? Maybe two years, maybe. Okay. Yeah, and he switched to safety after I graduated. But, I mean, he was the real deal back then, like a true pro already in college. One of those guys, like in yeah. college, this guy already has his act together. Yeah. Not everybody does. Um, but so much respect for him. And then Kyle Shanahan watching him grow up and, you know, future Hall of Fame coach Mike Shanahan um, just had such an important impact on my life. And our families are close. And then, you know, Brian Greasy was my quarterback. And Bobby T is a legend at running back. And Anthony Lynn's my teammate. That's right. Incredible running backs coach. And the Kubiak kids are over there. And, I mean, it... it you know, if you could go back and remember high school ball where you knew, so all you, those knew you knew all man. the families, right? It's like, oh, you're all there, you know, tailgating and you know everybody. That's what it feels like in the NFL. And I think that's rare. Like, unless you're on the team. Right. Like, to be a parent and feel like I know everybody. Oh, that's it's a one of one feeling. It's such a cool feeling. It right? is, dude. Like, you're a player experiencing that stuff. And now you're at this, you're, you know, you're a parent now, like coming back to it. And you're just like, yo. I would what be, a life. I would be embarrassed when my dad would come to the games and meet the coaches and be like, hey, so how's my son doing? I'm like, dad, yeah. shut up to get the car. Like, come on, man. Let's just, let's go. And that's all. You're probably hanging out with them, chopping it up, and they're just like, yo, this is one of us. Because you know a dad, it's like, hey, I'm proud of your son. He's doing a great job. You kind of hit him with the basics as a coach. But with you, it's like they can probably give you a little more inside ball and talk a little bit more, knowing you understand the craft as well, and they know your personality. And he that he has the connections with uh, GM coaches, head coaches, played with them. Like that is really special. So with all that, all like this family style thing with the 49ers, when Christian's playing for the Panthers, and that trade, you see the trade finally happen from the Panthers to the 49ers. Like, what's your reaction? Yeah, I, I was ecstatic because I know Kyle Shanahan. I know what an incredible coach he, he is. And then I looked at the roster, and I'm like, dude, this team is littered with talent. And I knew about all the guys we just mentioned, Anthony Lynn and Bobby T and Brian Greasy and the Kubiaks and all, all the other guys on – the coaching staff, and I'm like, this is a perfect situation for you. Kyle's going to know how to use you. He's a phenomenal coach. You know, you have a ton of other talent around you. You're going to get to be part of a great organization. I played for the 49ers. It's an incredible organization from Jed York on down. And so Lisa and I were ecstatic. Plus, we went to Stanford. It's in the Bay Area. I'm like, this is incredible for us. Easy flight from Denver. Um, but Christian, you know, he he's a team guy. He's like a loyal guy. Whoever his team is, those are his guys. He's a boy's boy. Yeah. So he was like, you know, hey, these are my guys. And, uh, you know, I've lived here for five and a half years. And I know our family is history, but I, I don't really, you know, know Kyle. I was four mm -hmm. during Super Bowl 33 running around in the confetti. And, and uh, so Lisa and I were super ex excited about it. But then one of the first things he did was he had a meeting with, with Kyle. Those guys got together and talked for like an hour and a half. 
and Christian asked him a lot of questions. You know, why'd you trade for me? How are you going to use me? He wanted to find out, you know, what his mindset was and how he viewed the game and him as a player. And Coach Shanahan, Kyle, did the same thing. He's like, look, this is why we brought you in. Let me get to know you a little bit. Because even though our families had this history, you know, when you're four and another kid's in high school, you don't know each other. So it was really like their first time getting to know each other. And I thought that was pretty mature, both of them. It's like, hey, let's get to know each other. Mm -hmm. Forget all this talk about our families, man to man. This is you and me. Let's find out what we're all about. And after the you know, hour, hour and a half meeting, I mean, Christian, me, Christian called me up and said, hey, I'm in the right place. This is this is That's awesome. This was the place for me. Did you have any uh, tip off or hint that that was in the works before it happened? No, Lisa actually did uh, a podcast and with her friend Ashley, and they brought on Peggy Shanahan, and they joked around about the trade a few days before it happened. But we didn't know any more than anybody else. We're following social media. It could be the Rams, could be the 49ers. You know, if you're an organization, you're not going to show your hand because you're in a bidding war with other teams. Right. So nobody's going to tell anybody anything. So we we were very happy when we heard the news. <clears throat> that is awesome. That fires me up. Should we dive into the uh, the glory days of the Broncos? Yes. Uh, a question before we do get yeah. to those two Super Bowls in a row. Like your first one was with the Niners, but you're with the Niners for a year. And uh, do you feel like not? Uh, this is not. A, I'm not trying to. This is going to sound disrespectful, but I knew it was your, one of your lower statistical years. Did you get injured during that year with the 49ers? Yeah, because I was going to start over Jerry Rice, but then <laughs> I had an I tweaked my ankle, I think, in training. No. Um, I, look, I played for the New York Giants, and, and I got there during a time that had a lot of adversity. Bill Parcells was my coach. I love getting the call from him on draft day. Hey, we drafted you in the third round. Um, this is when camp starts. Uh, we'll see you there. Oh, it wasn't the red carpet treatment you get today, right? And yeah. I had to wait around on a rotary phone to find out if I was drafted because the television coverage didn't cover every round. I was the third round draft pick. So I didn't even know we were off the television coverage. And then when I got there, he get, you know, Coach Parcells gave a great speech about how we just won the Super Bowl. So we don't really need any of you guys, but hopefully one or two of you can make the team and contribute. Uh, and so it was not a red carpet treatment. It was kind of shocking. Like, whoa, like I got drafted, but there's no guarantee. And back then you'd see second and third round picks cut. Like you weren't guaranteed to make the team just because you were drafted. Um, fortunately, I made the team, but unfortunately, Bill Parcells stepped down and uh, he had some heart issues or, as, as it was reported and stepped down. And, and then, you know, we were one of the oldest teams. We just won a Super Bowl. A lot of guys started retiring, switching teams, new ownership and then new uh, coaches and then new players and um, it's just all this adversity. So, you know, I love that team. Like I'm a team guy too. Like I love my teammates from the giants and we had, but then we had a coaching change and I got cut. And when I got cut, it was, it was a wake up call. I'm like, man, I'm going to go to business school or law school. I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, I think I'll make a team, but I just got cut. So I don't know. And uh, I thought, what do I want? You know, what kind of team do I want to go to? I'm a free agent. I got like four or five teams to choose from. And I'm like, I want to win a Super Bowl. I want to go to a team that has a chance to win a Super Bowl. So I took the league minimum and went out to San Francisco. I'm like, I'm going to try out for this team. And there were 14 receivers, and they take four. Like, imagine a team that only takes four receivers this year. But it's Jerry Rice, John Taylor. They had won Super Bowls already, right? Those were the starters. And there's a lot of 21 personnel, so they didn't play a ton of three receivers. And then it was me and Nate Singleton. Um, but, you know, that, those guys feel like brothers to me. I was there seven months. But, like, Bart Oates, who started at right tackle – like allowed me to ship all my boxes to his house, took us in like we were family. Steve Young was incredible, incredible to me, got to learn from Jerry Rice. I see those guys this year. It's like a reunion every home game at the 49ers. I'm dapping people up, all my old teammates. I'm like, and it, it seems like yesterday. But I was backing up Jerry, so I didn't get on the field a lot. In the Super Bowl, I got in for a couple plays. Jerry dinged his shoulders, uh, one of his shoulders, and I, I get in the game and I'm thinking, I'm going to Disney World, man. Like I had one quick catch for five yards. I'm like, I'm just getting heated up. Like, I may be the one going to Disney World. And then, of course, Jerry comes back, and I go back to the sideline. I think I had a special teams tackle on kickoff. But I was around. I mean, we had 14 Pro Bowl players. We had the offensive player of the year in Steve Young, the defensive player of the year in Deion Sanders, who I went against every day in practice. So I'm backing up Jerry Rice, uh, the greatest receiver of all time, and, and going against Deion, greatest DB of all time, for a whole year. And I really think I got way better because of going, because of learning behind Jerry and competing against Dion, and then that kind of set the tone for the rest of my career with the Broncos. Is that a work ethic of Jerry Rice as sickening as it as yeah. it's portrayed? It absolutely is. He had this hill that he used to run, and the thing that was just amazing about him is uh, his conditioning. And you don't always think about like your endurance, like footballs 
kind of an anaerobic sport. It's sprint, stop, sprint, stop, sprint, stop. But he wouldn't slow down in the fourth quarter, and he could run for days. We had this rule in San Francisco, which we continued in Denver, where if you're a receiver, you had to catch it and finish 40 yards. And it's like, okay, 40 yards, right? So that means catch it and run a little bit and then stop. No, they had 40 yards. They had a cone for 40 yards. You had to sprint 40 yards after every reception. Nobody does that, but, but he would do it every time. And if we were not across midfield, Jerry would sprint to the end zone. So we literally had to start moving our drill closer to the end zone from the 40 so he would get back to the huddle in time for the next play because he would score on every play. He did it all the time for the whole practice all year long. And I'm thinking his conditioning level is off the charts. He just doesn't get tired. So that was one of his greatest skill sets. His other greatest skill set was getting off the ball quickly. Nobody got off the line, off the snap count faster than him. It was like he timed it. And it was almost simultaneous. As soon as the ball even twitched, he was already off the line. Mm -hmm. So if he was a 4-5 guy and there was a 4-3 guy, he'd beat him five yards down the field because he was off, the, off uh, the line quicker. And then the other thing was after he caught the ball, he would catch it and turn up field instantly. So like all the angles for defenders, you're trying to tie, he's going to catch it, then he's going to like maybe a little hesitation and then try to go upfield. It was seamless, like catch and go, catch and go. So all those shallow crosses and mm -hmm. short routes. And I'm like, man, I want to be more like that. And then he would, he would make routes his own. Like I was always thinking, run the route exactly the way the coach tells you to run the route. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I'd say, well, Jerry didn't run that exactly the way the coach drew it up. Right. He, he ran a comeback, but he kind of bent it in on a post. And then the next time he kind of bent out and stemmed it up. I'm like, he's getting open every time, but he's like three different ways to run the same route. And so I, I started copying some of that stuff and it worked. So, um, yeah, that was a, a great year for me. It was a fun year. We won a Super Bowl, got lifelong friends from that experience. And it really helped me become a better player. All right. How we doing, folks? I'm pulling up another ad read here. We're interrupting this episode. And guess what we're going to bring you? We're bringing you Cars.com. Cars.com is a leading digital marketplace that connects car shoppers to their perfect car, celebrating 25 years of helping shoppers research, find inventory, finance, and also sell cars. Quick cough. Hold on. <coughs> All right. Whether well, Wherever life takes you next and whoever you're looking to be, there's a car for you on Cars.com. Up to 50,000 cars are added daily to cars.com. Shop over 2 million cars for 2 million possibilities. Find your next possibility on cars.com. Where to next? Back to the episode. When Jerry's like kind of cutting it up and doing routes a little bit different, the first couple of times you tried to do it, where the coach is like, listen, you're not Jerry Rice. Don't be doing that. Because there was a couple of times where... Hey, brother, you're white. You know, run the route. Yeah, yeah, you're white. You know what you are. Like, do your, do your thing. We could change like, Delaney block. Walker was a guy that I played with who would yeah. just kind of run his own routes. And the coaches were like, Delaney Walker, you know, makes a Pro Bowl. Great wide receiver. He was like our only threat at the time in 2014 and 2015. And then the next tight end would come up and do the same thing. And he would just get chewed out. Like, you need to run the route correctly. Did you ever run, run into anything like that? Well, no, I'm having a flashback now. I actually... The first time I stole a route from Jerry was I was playing with the Giants and we played them in the playoffs and I got in the game, but I was watching film to get ready for the game with New York, but also watching their offense as well. I was just watching a lot of film. Mm -hmm. So I watched Jerry on their team run a comeback route the way I just described, where he kind of took it a little bit at the post and came back out of it. And so I ran it that way against the 49ers and I was going against Merton Hanks, who was an all pro or at least pro bowl cornerback. And it worked, I got open and it worked. I'm like loving it. Um, and I actually got yelled at by my coach for running it that way after the game, we <laughs> lost the game, but I had a great game um, and, uh, and his, those routes worked. So when I got there, Maybe that influenced me to go there. I'm like, I want to learn from this dude. I think I can up my game. Um, I started copying everything that I could. But you, not every coach will allow you to do that, right? I mean, some coaches are like, you got to run it a certain way. But I think the best coaches know you, to get open against elite defenders, you, ha you have to make the route your own. If you just run a corner route, you know, you push it 10 to 12 and break straight to the corner, some dude's just going to run right next to you the whole time. If you don't create some kind of separation at the top of the stem or make it look like another route, these dudes are too good, right? And so um, I really help. I think it helped me become uh, grow from a good player to to a, you know an all pro a great player, player yeah. maybe. Yeah. You uh, you you brought up how like you guys lost a game, but you played well. How difficult it is as a player for people like watching, like when your team loses, but you play amazing, like kind of trying to suppress that kind of happy feeling that I I went off. Yeah. No, you guys know the game, right? So I mean, for me. You know, some people play because of the thrill of victory and other people play for the, from the fear of failure. It's like, I don't want to disappoint the guys on my team. Mm -hmm. Like no matter no, whether we win or lose, as long as I can leave this game and they know I gave them everything, 
that's going to have to be enough. Like I gave you everything I had. You guys know that you watched the film. I didn't, mm. I gave great effort. I, I did the best I could, man. Like no matter what happens, you guys know that that was the most important thing to me. My teammates know that I gave them everything I had win, lose or draw. There's no, it held nothing back. That's all I got for you. I gave you everything that that's, that's the most important thing you want to win. Cause it's so much more fun to celebrate, but, um, you know, it's the respect of your teammates, man. That means everything. Yeah. Uh, is it true? I, I would hear that there were old war stories and maybe they're just old tall tales, but Deion Sanders would tie his hands behind his back when trying to cover and trying to work and get better against Jerry Rice. Is that true or false? I can't say it never happened. I didn't see it happen, but I can't say that it never happened. So, no, yeah, that's a great way to fair answer. Yeah. That's a great answer. Yeah. Yeah. I bet those battles were just, you know, fun to watch, like knowing Dion prime time, the style he yeah. is. Are you surprised with his success as a head coach? Not at all, man. He's a competitor. He's an incredibly smart football coach. And, um, you know, I, I really cherish that opportunity to go against him in practice every year. I remember at one point, you know, I, I actually had sprained my ankle in this charity basketball game. I, I warned my kids all the time, by the way, you know, don't goof around doing stupid stuff during the season. Yet I, I learned the hard way because I played in a basketball game, sprained my ankle, probably one of the reasons I got cut by the Giants in hindsight. <laughs> and then uh, and then I go and, um, you know, I have it all wrapped up like in a cast. And like as a receiver, maybe it's a little easier to get away when you're a lineman. But as a receiver, you need full ankle flexion to run. Right. And so I'm in this cast and, you know, they're doing everything. They're putting like emu oil on it, like maybe to reduce inflammation and whatever they can do. And um, it was like 120 degrees in Rockland, California at training camp. And I'm walking out there and uh, like just in this cast, there's 14 receivers. Like first they put me in a bunk bed with like eight dudes. There's like eight dudes in a room and bunks like the size of this. I'm like, I had to go up to George Schieffer and say, dude, if you want to cut me, cut me. But I can't, I'm not going to stay in a room full of bunk beds with a bunch of dudes that I know aren't going to be here. And I thought he was going to cut me on the spot, but he moved me into my own room. It was nice. Um, oh, yeah, that's a good power yeah, play. Yeah, yeah, I, power I, play. I, I swear to you, I thought I was going to get cut. But I'm walking out to practice. I'm like, look, I'm in these bunk beds. I'm in a cast. I got to go against Deion Sanders in this boot that I'm wearing every day. And I thought, you know what? If I beat him on one slant route, I'll tell my kids about it for the rest of my life. You know what I mean? Like just in practice, forget the game. Yeah. And so that was kind of the mentality he had. So I, I took pride in going against him. He made me a lot better. I'd like to think that I didn't let him take plays off in practice. And uh, I think that's why we won the Super Bowl and had such a great team. And it was the same, same with Jerry. Like I remember we would run sprints. And uh, I was always fresher because he played a whole game, right? I mean, right. I played like 10 plays in the game, some special teams. I'm fresh <laughs> on Monday. Yeah. And so we do conditioning. I just... You know, sometimes I just go full speed just to piss him off. Then he'd start going full speed. We did that before the Super Bowl one year. Um, you know, it's like end of one of the practice and we're conditioning just to get a little extra running in light. But I'm like, I'm feeling good, man. Like, I don't, I don't play that much. I'm feeling great. So I just take off full speed. And so the next rep we do, Jerry and John Taylor must have winked at each other. And all right, you're going to go full speed. So they start running full speed. Just in this after practice condition, I just hear Coach Shanahan go, stop. And like, I'm panicking. He's like, we don't need Jerry to pull a hammy like the week before the Super Bowl. <laughs> oh, no. I know it wasn't because of me. He didn't, care. <laughs> yeah, yeah. he didn't care if I pulled a hammy. But um, it was just funny. But I liked pushing him. But Jerry would never shy away from a challenge. That guy was so competitive. It was unbelievable. He's still competitive. He's still at the games running around, totally dialed into what's going on. Yeah. High-fiving people. Like, he's just wired that way. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get that slant route? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I did. You did? Won a couple. Well, when you have a whole season of practice, you better win at least one slant route. Got to. Any good yeah. shit talking stories with Dion? Dion, you know, he was the greatest teammate. He didn't he didn't talk smack ever in practice. What about in the game? Like you witnessed just being on the sideline and seeing Dion work. Well, I saw Dion, you know, they they tested him a couple times early in the season and once against Atlanta they tested him and you know he had played there and he high stepped from the fifty yard line all the way to the goal line. <laughs> While yeah, looking, so looking on the sidelines, holding the ball up in the air, I'm like, oh, my, like, not too many humans can do that. And the fact that he did it against his old team, it was just absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's all time. Uh, going to, uh, you know, your next, your next Super Bowl, but Denver's, uh, like John Elway's first Super Bowl, he was like 0-3 going into that game against the Packers, correct? And that I was his so, first yeah. Super Bowl, right? Yeah. It was, yeah. And what's what's funny is I was like looking up, uh, I was looking up this game, and the Packers were favored by eleven points going to the Super Bowl. Going in the Super Bowl when you guys, I think won it was Super Bowl. in the beginning of the week. It was fourteen, and then we stopped paying attention to it. But we had uh, we had an agreement. We're not going to talk about it. And you mentioned Shannon earlier in the episode. Shannon's a talker, and uh, for him not to talk any smack 
for two weeks is, is a minor miracle. I couldn't believe he didn't say anything, but we were dialed in the year before we lost to Jacksonville at home and we were the better team. We were the best team in the NFL right until we weren't. You know, we got upset by Jacksonville at home. They went on an incredible run, won like five games in a row. They beat us at home, but we were 14 and two, thought we were the best team in the league, took one bad game to get knocked out. So that next year, we were just totally dialed. You know, we went on the road every game. We had to go to Kansas City and Pittsburgh, win games on the road against really good teams with great coaches, and we found a way to do it. So by the time we got to the Super Bowl, there's, no t there's nothing to say. Let's just go get it done. Nobody said a word. In the beginning of the week, we were 14-point underdogs, but we had all the confidence in the world. We thought we should have won the Super Bowl the year before, but because we didn't and got upset by Jacksonville, people kind of forgot about us. And they, they were like, Green Bay had won the Super Bowl the year before. They were the favorite. Um, and they were a great team. I mean, they had Hall of Famers on their team, but there was no doubt in our mind. I can't, you, you guys have been around teams where you're confident, and it's not false bravado. It's like, we're really confident. Like, we believed we would win. Mm -hmm. And we did, but they were against a great team. Never made the chance to go to a Super Bowl, though, which was heartbreaking. Oh, We were two quarters away against the Chiefs, yeah. 2019. That's why, the, that's why great players, not all, I mean, a lot of great players never get to one or get to one and don't win one. And it's, yeah. If it wasn't it's, for Patrick uh, Mahomes and his 4 5 running around on a two-minute drill, we would have got it done. Yeah. It's not about me, though. It feels <laughs> a lot like... But no, yeah. you know the feeling. Like, you know exactly how hard it is to get to these games and win them. There's no guarantees, right? And it's hard work. It's determination. It's having all the right players. It's the coaches making the right calls. It, some of it's the way the ball bounces, too. And it's not just like... Like, you think in high school when you're playing, it's like, oh, we'll get them next year, we'll get them next year. And then once you get in the NFL for a couple of years and you taste a little bit of, like, playoff success... You think, all right, next year we're going to get over the hump. And it's like, that's not always the case. Sometimes you guys just might suck. There'll be a lot of turnover on the team. And so you have to like, take advantage of those opportunities while yeah. you're there. Yeah. Because we were, we were the one seed in, uh, here I go again, we were the one seed in 21. Yeah. And we got upset by the Bengals. And it was like, we really thought, like, this is the year. Like, we just, Derrick Henry came back, all that. And we're like, this is really going to be the year that the Titans win the Super Bowl. I played on a team like that in New York my first year. We, uh, they just won the Super Bowl. That was the year they beat the Bills. They held on to the ball for like 49 minutes, right? They beat, the, they beat the Bills in the Super Bowl. And I'm with all those legends, Lawrence Taylor and Phil Sims and, um, you know, O.J. Anderson was the MVP of that game, and they had a lot of the same guys back. Mm -hmm. And the expectation going into that season is we're going to win the Super Bowl again. We just won it. We're going to win it again. Yeah. And we finished eight and eight. Well, it was. Uh, Do you got a? Uh, I was just going to ask if you had an iconic uh, Lawrence Taylor story. Uh, there's so many iconic Lawrence Taylor stories. I'll share one with you. Um, you know, it was frowned upon to hold out during training camp, but I was a third round draft pick and held out for like eight days. So when I finally get there, it's in Fairleigh Dickinson University. And, uh, you know, there's the old wooden lockers and they have like your name and tape with a Sharpie written on the top of these wooden locker, you know, ad hoc lockers. They made at Fairleigh Dickinson University's, uh, you know, basketball gym, auxiliary gym, and I'm walking through there. These guys have already been through a week of practice, and it's hot and humid in Fairleigh Dickinson in New Jersey in August. So I'm walking through, you know, it's a locker room, smells like a locker room. I keep walking through. I look up at my locker, and my name's spelled wrong, of course, on my locker. Um, but I sit down, and sure enough, I'm between Lawrence Taylor and Carl Banks. I'm like, okay, I'm the receiver from Stanford. How do I get between two all-pro linebackers? Mm -hmm. um, and I sit down, and they were just finishing their first practice. But back then, like as soon as you sign, get out to practice. So they had just finished their first practice. I'm like making sure all my equipment's there. I sit down. Lawrence's locker is just disaster. It was a messy locker. There's stories about you know the equipment guys finding game checks in the bottom of the locker they didn't even know were there. <laughs> Things like that. I found out about that later. But anyway, I sit down and. Uh, you know, they both come back and I'm like, Lawrence Taylor just sat next to him. Like I already know Lawrence Taylor. He's famous already, right? For right. on and off field. And I'm like, then the other guy, you know, is Carl Banks. He's like six six, you know, NFL Pro Bowl linebacker. They just won the Super Bowl. Um and uh, Lawrence is like, hey, man, anyone see my cleat? He was like missing a cleat or something. And Carl's like, no, man. I think this dude took it, and I've never met them. I don't even, you know, haven't formally been introduced. Yeah. And uh, they both stand up as I'm sitting in my locker, and they're just towering over me. And they're like, "Hey, man, you got my cleat?" And they're not messing around. Like it seems like they're just going to beat the crap out of me on day one. And I'm thinking, my first day in the NFL is my last day in the NFL. And then he's like, "Ah, I'm just messing with you," and slaps me on the back super hard. And I'm like, "What just happened?" That's my. I, mean, I just got here. I haven't met these first guys yet. First impression in the but, NFL. Yeah. Thank the, the Lord. Menace of Lawrence. Yeah. Thank the Lord. Uh, they were kidding around, but he was smart. He had an incredible sense of humor. He was a very funny dude, and he was a great teammate. But in games, 
I, I do believe he's the greatest defender of all time. Like I watch him in games and tackles would just quiver. Like you're like, dude, you got to help me out. Put a tight end over here, running back, something. Don't leave me one-on-one -on -one with this dude. Because he's just one of those guys, like when he walks in the room, he's the alpha. And nobody questions it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's, that's LT. That's the alpha. Yeah, and, and he, he's one of those guys in the weight room. He just had like that natural... I don't know if you want to call it like dad strength that you would call it where he'd walk in and I never really saw him lift a lot. But when he did, I'm like, that dude's pushing like ridiculous weight. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time I've seen him lift. Does he lift at home or something? Like, where's he working out? <laughs> like, right. And, uh, you know, he's like six, five two fifty something runs under four five. You know, they had clips of him as rookie or running down as the gunner just out running DBs to tackle the punt returner. And he's just a, a specimen. Some guys just have it all, man. He also had also another LT story. He, I remember one game, not all players are treated the same. You know that, right? So, yeah. like, if this happened to me, I would have been cut in a second. But, um, yeah, I guess he was late. I don't know what the story was, why he was late or what happened to his car. But he comes running out during the national anthem. We're there, you know, and they're playing the national anthem. And out of the corner of my eye, I see this guy running onto the field with his jersey halfway on, like trying to get the rest of his jersey onto his shoulder pads, runs out during the national anthem, like missed the pregame, missed everything, and then totally had a sack on the first defensive uh, possession. Like, it's like he didn't even need to warm up. Like he just showed up right before the game, gets a sack, like nothing ever happened. Like you missed the whole pregame. Nobody said anything to him? Nobody said a no word. No one said a word. No one said a word. That's like the ultimate nightmare when you're playing yeah. sports is like you have a dream that you're supposed <laughs> to get to the game, but you can't get to the game and like the national yeah, anthem is yeah. going on yeah. and you're like trying to get dressed as fast as possible. But what would happen to most people, right? Yeah, you're getting chewed out. You're probably getting benched. Window or aisle, right? Yeah. You're, you're out of here. Whereas LT, okay, LT, hurry up, man. Get your jersey on. You're in. Yeah, like, yeah. It's third Three down. Three guys are helping yeah, him taping the jersey yeah. up. They're all in the headset. Hey, LT's punt. here, thank God. LT's yeah. here, thank God. <laughs> no, yeah. but he was, uh, I mean, it, I was blessed to play with so many great players and he was one of them like to play with somebody who's considered the greatest at his position or one you know if not the greatest defensive player of all time and i got to play with that guy it was pretty cool boys and girls i know you're looking at my hair right now and you're thinking to yourself damn maybe i want something like that well i got something for you dude sport clips your hair may grow fast but after going to sport clip sport clips haircuts you'll wish it grew even faster that's because sport clips has the best seats in hair and that may or may not be because they happen to be right in front of your TVs playing football, sports, all kind of sports every single day. We know watching sports while getting your haircut definitely beats the reflection of getting your haircut. You know the product's going to come. Why, feel, why watch the process when you can watch the game? Am I right? At Sport Clips, you can check out, check in with the pros in men's hair and totally check out with pure uninterrupted relaxation so yeah come watch an endless stream of sports on tv while getting an awesome haircut sport clips it's a game changer subscribe rate five stars back to this episode and you know hey, slack yourself dude you've shown a lot of humility obviously when we introduced you we start clapping for you you start clapping as well you're just a team guy through and through i was watching a uh, a video with the broncos and there was like a, one of the reporters but somebody that works with the broncos and they're asking you your top three favorite plays as a bronco Two of those three plays, you weren't even the one making the catch or anything. One was a victory formation, and one was you watching a teammate score a touchdown, know you're going to win the Super Bowl. And then third one, obviously, was a great catch by you in the end zone. But what a three! What are the your three like favorite plays of all time that you were like the main receiver for? Oh gosh, I don't even know. You mentioned the victory formation. That was Super Bowl Thirty Two. Is the yeah. Broncos' first Super Bowl, and I got to be at the, that point of the V in the back and just watching the clock just slowly pixelate down to zero. Man, I think about it almost every day. It was like the greatest experience of all time and just the family running onto the field and just John Elway's crying and laughing at the same time as just the first Super Bowl Denver ever won. And what a blessing to be part of that. Like, you know, I won one Super Bowl with the Niners. It was kind of a backup role, but it was such a cool thing to win a Super Bowl with my teammates. But this one was, like, incredible. I mean, to see the look on Broncos fans' faces, so many had, like, generationally gone to games with their dad or uncles or families, and some of them had passed, and then finally the Broncos win, and John fought his whole career for that. And we worked so hard, and we were such big underdogs, right? I mean, that was uh, – uh, that's tough to beat. You're not going to beat that one. I, I, you know, I don't know, man. I remember some of the plays I made. I don't remember all of them. People sometimes remind me of plays I don't even remember making because mm -hmm. um, it was always, you know, make a play, turn the page on to the next. So I don't know. I don't, I don't have favorite plays of myself. I have favorite memories. And usually, you know, those around the big games and the Super Bowls, the one you mentioned about Rod Smith mm -hmm. caught a touchdown against Atlanta. That was such a big pivotal play in our game that helped us win. And I get to see that play because, you know, he was in front of me and I get to, like, chase him down the field and watch him score. 
Um, but so much that happens in those games you don't see, right? You're doing your job. You don't see what everyone else is doing unless you go back and watch the film. And one of the interesting things about Super Bowls is the season's over after that game. Mm -hmm. So I've probably watched those games less than any other games. That's awesome. If somebody not answering your question, that's my favorite thing that's ever happened. Yeah. <laughs> that's my favorite non answer I don't know. If, episode if you, ever. If you put them all up on, on, I pick them if you put them up. I don't even, I don't remember half of them. Really? Yeah. I guess there was a good, good one against Green Bay. Anyone that was a longer than, so you know, was a good touchdown. One. Yeah. yeah. That would be fun. But um, no, nah, I don't really, I don't put them in order. I, I loved all of them. Even the blocks, even, even blocking in the run game. Like uh, one of my favorite feelings was if TD flew past me mm -hmm. and like, I knew I took care of my guy. Like I, I played tackle, right? Like we're kindred spirits here. So as a receiver, Hell yeah, we I, are. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have got on the field if I didn't block. Like mm -hmm. that's how I got on the field. That's how Rod Smith got on the field. So we'd have like these little side bets, five, 10 bucks, dude, I bet I have more decleaters than you. He'd say, hell no, you won't have more decleaters than me. And then we'd like, let's get our team, let's get our head coach, Mike Shanahan to stop the tape because he's going to have to, because we're going to declete somebody in this game. And we would just literally go for decleters. Not just not bucks. just blocks. Yeah, five or ten bucks. I'm like, uh, yeah, he was undrafted. And I just yeah, I know. Little, was but, back then. little light. He's like in the middle of but his was, career. Yeah, you know, yeah, going yeah. on a Super Bowl run. Five, you know what? You know what's funny though? It didn't take more than that. All right, you're on, man. Let's do it. It was more of the pride thing, right? The mm -hmm. money was nothing, but um, it was so fun. And that was year my first year with the Broncos. I didn't play that much, but competing with Rod to get decleaters and just the the feeling you get when your head coach. When you're not one of the main guys on the team, you're not a starter, you're a backup. When he stops the film in front of the whole team after the game and said, oh, wait a minute, well, who's that over there? Let's check this out. Like, oh, hell yeah, there we go. Yeah. All right, we just look at each other like, all right. Um, it was just such a fun feeling, man. Ball was fun. That's the best moment. I feel like Shanahan, oh, my fault, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, in a team meeting when, you, when there's literally a, a pause and a yes. highlight on you, and you get to go watch it through and the pride that just goes through your body. And then on the flip side, the low light oh, yeah. when it's put on mm -hmm. you and you're just like please god kill I had, me. Get me i out had here. one of those too and you're right it's the worst feeling in the world to you be. just feel like you've let everybody down yeah, and the they room. don't you know coach shanahan would never embarrass you he doesn't call people out to embarrass them but he like one he has high expectations so we i think we had a game against cleveland where we lost and that happened to me and you're right i'm thinking you know, i played pretty well i had a pretty good game actually statistically it was one of my better games and he's like well guys this is what we need to do to get better and i'm like clip number three like diving for a ball in the back of the end zone that went off my fingertips. And even to this day, I'm like, I don't know if I could have caught it, but he's like, these are the plays we have to make. <laughs> and I'm like, no. I'm like, oh. <laughs> it's all like just in, and when, you know, something about when you do an offense, it's one thing, but when the whole team's in there, like the yeah. defense is in there, mm -hmm. the other side of the ball, all the coaches, it's like, you, I mean, you feel like you let your team down, you feel sick to your stomach, but it's done in a professional way. And it just, it makes sure that you don't exhale, right? Nobody, hey, even if you had a good game, you have a play in this game where you could have done better. That could have been the difference in the game. Mm -hmm. We need to make these plays to win. And that was the expectation. But you're right. The feeling you get is just nausea. Yeah. Yeah. Go I feel like uh, about it. I feel like Coach Shanahan, he always, he probably, it was probably obviously throughout his career, but I feel like he always did a good job of calling out, you know, calling out guys in team meetings and, and hyping them up. And whether it's the low lights, having the teaching moments and everything else, but he would always like spotlight guys basically in all of our team meetings, like every day. Like I remember my first call out, I was just on practice squad and I played, it sucked. I had the fullback tight end linebacker and he, I got to stand up and he's just talking about, you know, all the different things that I would have to do and everything else. And I just remember it was like the best feeling in the world. Later that day after practice, he tried talking me into fullback and gave me some runaround story about how some, <laughs> <laughs> linebacker went to fullback in Denver and from that moment I intentionally played poorly as a fullback because I did not want to go to the offensive offensive side of the ball yeah so you I think you have a good feel for how Kyle Shanahan coaches because he he does it in a very similar way he speaks to every position on the team but as tell, you tell me as a defensive player when your head head coach who's your offensive coordinator n knows your job and your responsibility and talks about it in front of the whole team right does that gain him a little extra respect than a coach that may, might be a figurehead who isn't sure exactly what you're doing on your side of the ball? Yeah, I felt like Shanahan, He because he would float around all the different uh, position meetings as well, and it felt like he had just as good of a grasp defensively as he did offensively. But yeah, when you'd get a call out like that or understand that, like, okay, he knows all these things that are going on, it was like, uh, it, it was cool because when we were like growing up, like Denver, I mean, we were like, what, 10, 11, 
when all when those yeah. when there were those championships. So you guys were like, you know, in front of everybody. Like I, you just remember the Shannon Sharps, the Terrell Davis, the Ed McCaffrey's, and uh, Coach Shanahan being that Super Bowl winning coach. So getting that one year was just super cool because you'd see him on TV all the time. It's like, oh, this dude's your this dude's your head coach. Yeah, I'm glad you got a feel for that because that's the, Kyle. You know, he made this team his own, and like things have changed offensively, scheme wise. But he takes the same approach, and then I I have to be a football coach. I have to know everybody's assignment. I'm going to watch every position meeting. I'm going to know offense, defense, special teams. I'm going to have team meetings where I talk about uh, offense, defense, and special teams in front of everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it, I think what it does when you have a coach like that, it makes everyone kind of sit up a little straighter. It makes everyone respect him because they know he knows their assignment, you know, on their right. side of the ball, and uh, and they they believe in him and they they trust in him. And I think that's what you're seeing with the 49ers. Well, earlier, when you were talking about your uh, that first Broncos Super Bowl, the way you guys felt like you should have won it the year before, going 14 and two, you lose one to Jacksonville, and there was just that confidence of like, hey, there's nothing to say. We got to go out and win the Super Bowl. Doesn't matter if you guys were 11 point underdogs. I feel like that's a very similar situation right, right now with the Niners. Like you go in, you lost Brock last year against the Eagles. Like you were a team that you probably felt like, oh, we're gonna do it this year, and then you don't. I feel like that expectation for the 49ers this year is like, hey, there's there's like nothing to say. Like we have to take care of business against the Chiefs. Yeah, there's. I mean, there's no talking doesn't do anything, right? And I think, you know, the Chiefs have been to a few Super Bowls, right? They they're the same way. It's like, hey, they know that nothing you say is gonna make a difference. You got to go out and play. And I think the 49ers understand that. I do think. You know, when you have a, a young quarterback and different players on your team, it does make, mean something when, you know, if you lose a championship game because your quarterback got hurt and then you play the same team week 13 and then you go out and beat them pretty good, I think that builds confidence, mm -hmm. right? I think when you're down 17 in the championship game and you're like, we're facing the biggest comeback in championship history and then you come back and win the game, it, it does give you some confidence. And I think when you get into the big big game, the Super Bowl, right, you do draw on that. Hey, like, no matter what the score is, we're never out of this. So no matter how this unfolds, you believe in yourself. We don't need to change what we're doing. We've been here before. You hope everything goes well and you got the lead and everything goes great the whole game. But if it doesn't, you don't blink. You don't have to change what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they, they also haven't put four quarters together yet. Like they, yeah. they have not done yeah, in the 16 minutes of football coming together a couple of years ago, losing to the same team. Like this is just breeding a, a like a, a get back year. Let's hope they do it this this game, right? Let's put it all together this week. I was defensively, if we can put the second half of Green Bay and the second half of Detroit together, mm -hmm. that one game defensively, then offensively take the second half and put that together, uh, it would be one heck of a game. But um, I'm looking forward to it, man. It's going to be a close game, two great teams. You know, Kansas City's looking at a dynasty. There's nothing to say. You just got to go and play ball. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt this episode to bring you Ashley Furniture. I, if you're watching on YouTube right now or listening, I want to tell you, if you're listening right now, let me just paint a picture for you. I am sitting on a couch. My bum is super comfy. I could lay on this thing and literally sleep for an hour. I literally go into hibernation like a bear for the winter and wake up feeling amazing. And that is because I am sitting on Ashley Furniture couch right now. This thing is up to trend, it's up to styles, it's affordable, and it's got quality, a part of it, dude. And I have a special thing for you right now. If you use if you use our code, Barstool, you can save some money at ashley.com. If you uh, have the opportunity and you're listening on Spotify, Apple, Downcast, anything, go ahead and pop over to the YouTube or on Rumble. You can see me sitting on this thing right now, and you're thinking to yourself, damn, that's a good-looking couch, and he's already said he's comfortable. I might have to double down on that. With that being said, let's get back to this episode. Big hugs and tiny kisses. What's the prediction? I never, I never predict anything. I think this well, is my give a prediction. This is my prediction. It's going to be a hell of a game, and it's going to be close, and it's going to be hard fought. And uh, the team that makes the most plays at the end of the day will win it. But uh, so, what's your prediction? <laughs> I, I, close I, game, Niners on top. You know, as as if this was, if I didn't have a kid playing in it, I'd feel free making a prediction. But whenever I watch my kids' games, it's like, look, I'm a dad now. I'm, I'm taking off my coach's cap, putting on my dad's cap. I love you. I'm here for you no matter what. Be cheering for you on game day, and uh, and you know, hopefully it goes well. Do we got a dad hat for him? That would have been great if we just throw on the old yeah. dad hat. We also, no, I just got a, a package at the room the, that came in. I have a whole bunch of dad hats and bus marks. Really? To send over to. I yeah. just picture him just saying that I take off my coaching hat, and then he just all of a sudden puts puts a dad hat on. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Would be nice. I love it. Yeah, yeah. man. Put your dad hat on. No, um, but it, it's it's tough, man, because you uh you know anything I say. Oh, go. thank yeah, you. I love it, man. Hat I, got, you go, yeah, dad. I am in. honored. I earned a dad hat. Let's yeah. go. Thank you. But you know, every, you know, if I say anything, it'll be repeated. So I'm ho I you know, I think you know, two great teams. What are you gonna do? Mm -hmm. you, you guys have played ball. You came so close, right? And you 
been on a lot of, in a lot of games, won some, lost some, and you know we've watched a lot of Super Bowls. So I'm, I'm hoping the 49ers, like you said, put two halves together and get it done. But I played in too many games, won too many, lost too many to to make predictions. Can you talk about uh, the uh, Christian McCaffrey Foundation? Yeah, uh, he started that a few years ago, and it started out um, helping military families. He is so uh, invested in helping military families, and from um, you know military men and women that come back and need help after they've served our country uh, to helping their families. And um, I know right now there's some specific things he's trying to do to help them recover and take care of their bodies and deal with their physical issues um, that he's trying to help them with, especially you know some of the Rangers and high level. Uh, military personnel and so it started out um, helping them and it's kind of expanded to also helping out um, children in uh, hospitals uh, across the country um, you know he had this kid Logan who's not no longer with us just incredible kid who uh, was in the hospital in the children's ward and all he wanted to do was play video games with his friends but you're sequestered you're away from your friends and there's it's really hard to play video games online with everybody and maybe the hospitals didn't have those units so we created the logan bowl last year where kids in hospitals around the country could play with their friends on these consoles and so that's a really really cool thing that he did as well um so it means a lot to him to give back um, you know, Logan was buried in Christian's jersey in, in Carolina, and he had he had such like, dude, when that happens, like it's tugging on your heartstrings. It it had such an impact on Christian. I mean, he had more influence on Christian than Christian had on him. But like in his name, he wants to continue to be able to give um, kids that experience when mm. they're hospitalized for them, for their families, and so he had a Logan Bowl last year where a bunch of NFL guys competed online in this little playoffs and. And it was a lot of fun, but supporting military families and supporting you know kids in hospitals across the country has always been really important to them. That's awesome. I know you guys. Uh, you also have some youth football, some youth football camps. Yeah, I've been doing a camp. Gosh, since my kids were little. Originally, it was just for them and their buddies. Just rolled a ball in the park and started getting more and more kids Put together. The ball down. Yeah. Ball down. Let's play ball. And then uh, over the years. Um, I just realized there's so many kids. I never went to a football camp growing up. I played basketball, never even went to a football camp. Started playing in high school, played little league football, but just signed up for my team. Never went to a camp to learn how to play football. And uh, and never learned speed training or sports performance. So I'm like, I'd like to teach some of these kids some of the stuff I learned over the years uh, that might not have access to this type of stuff. So we bring in uh, Lauren Lando and his sports performance staff. He was the sports uh, trainer for the Broncos for a number of years, the strength coach, and now he's at Notre Dame. But we'd bring in him and his crew and they teach him speed training. Like, you know, a lot of kids didn't learn that back when I was growing up. I'm mm -hmm. like, I want them to learn about speed training. Um, and then we'd bring in celebrity NFL coaches and players to talk to the kids about their experience and about you know, the importance of staying in school and getting good grades, and they'd share their stories. And then a lot of high school and college and NFL coaches love to coach. Some of these guys are no longer coaching, but they love ball. And so between teaching the kids the game in a very safe way, um, teaching them speed training, letting them hear from motivational speakers, um, helping the coaches who want to coach, you know, work for four days in the summer, it's just a feel good for me. I just love doing it. Overnight camp? No, it's a four day day camp. And okay. we have two camps during the same same four days. We have an elite camp, which is for athletes that really want to learn one p specific position. So, you know, older kids, but still under eighth grade. And then an open camp for anybody. And we bring in a lot of kids from the Boys and Girls Club and other organizations, kids from military families. Um, and you don't have to have ever played football before. There's no pads. It's seven on seven and skill training and speed training. That's cool. I, yeah. if, uh, if kids were interested in going to one of those, where, where could they find that? SportsEddy.com. It's S -P Sports Eddie. Yeah, Sports Eddie, but it's S P O R T S E D D Y. Sports Eddie, like an Eddie, like if you're a fisherman. In a okay. SportsEddy.com. We've been doing camp for like over 20 years, and um, it's the highlight of my summer. I enjoy it every June, 17th through the 20th this year. Kids flying from out of out of state. Some of my old high school buddies bring their kids from Pennsylvania and. A lot of people vacation in Colorado, and they'll mark their calendars for that week just so their kids can have some fun playing ball. Oh, that's that awesome. Is, yeah, that is really cool, man. You got anything else? I do not. JP, Mitch, anybody got anything for, for Mr. McCaffrey? Yeah. The only way for Christian to win the Super Bowl was for you to lose all of yours. Would you do it? So JP just asked if – here, go ahead, JP. 
if the only way yeah. the only <laughs> if the only way for Christian to win a Super Bowl would be yeah. that you lose all of yours. Yeah, I'm not. Do it? I'm not getting in these hypotheticals, but. Um, <laughs> Hey, you got to yes. answer that question. Well, you well, have to answer that question. I don't have to answer that question. Right. Yeah, you, you really do. don't have to, but hey, yes, you, you do. Don't back down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What, you guys think you can take me? <laughs> <laughs> I still got hey, some of the old man shit. Like, hey, yeah, you're right, though. Hey, yeah, great. You know, I, I show, tell man. you that you care more about your kids than you care about yourself. At least I do. Like, so I want I want so badly uh, for him to have success and to win. But I don't, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I got my friends and my teammates and Christian's experience back then and my family and... But I would, I would pay a, you know, I would, I would give up a lot for him to be able to have that experience, I'm, including I'm, that's your just Bowls. not your Super Bowl rings. Right. I will give him all three of the Lombardi trophies in in my office uh, for him to win this one. Let's go. Cool. Yeah, let's do it. I man. tell you what, I know you did that begrudgingly, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you for dealing thank with you. us. No, no, it, it is, man. It's I'm telling you, it changes your world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've seen some like gymnastics or ballet or something like that, yeah. right? Yeah. Right? And you watch your kids run around. Like, what wouldn't you do for your kids? I know, you know man. I mean? It is. It is really cool, man. Thanks a lot for coming on. This was yeah. this was all time. I couldn't sure wait. Was. Whenever we booked you, we couldn't wait to tell CMC like, hey, man, we got your old man. Your old I know man. it's going on. I got my phone's right here. I texted him. I said we got you on. I know, he must I have been in was, practice. All I said was Big Ed. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> He's a, yeah, yeah, Big Ed. Not a lot like, of words. Got anything like, for me? He wants to like we can get you like cooking going. And he's like Big Ed. It's awesome. All right. <laughs> he's fo he's yeah. focused. He's dialed. He's in. focused. He's dialed. I'll tell you what. He yeah, because the the NFC Championship game, he had that hit towards the end zone where he kind of went off the head yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And I was like, hey man, that like you could see him kind of like looking around. Give me one. And you only see Christian do the give me one thing ever. And so I texted him after the game. I was like, hey, man, saw the hit. Hope you're all good. Uh, good luck in a couple of weeks. He's like, I'm fine. That was yeah. his response. I was like, oh, yeah. fuck yeah, dude. That he got me died, fired bro. up. Yeah. No, he was fine. He just, he needed one. He, you know, he never likes coming out. But yeah. uh, no, he was good to go. He was ready to come back in if they, if they needed him to. But that's, awesome. that's one of the reasons it's great having two weeks off also, right? I remember mm -hmm. there was a short period of time there where you only had one week off before the Super Bowl. I'll never forget it. It was Pittsburgh in that particular game, and one of the receivers missed the game. Had he had two weeks, he would have been able to play. So I think it's good there's that week in between the game, the yeah. championship and the Super Bowl. I can't imagine the anticipation of having two weeks, though. Like, obviously, the excitement. We're going to the Super Bowl. Then probably by Tuesday or Wednesday the next week or that week, you're like, I'm still a week and a half away from playing in this game yeah, and not like getting so excited to where like you kind of blow your load on like the following Wednesday. I'll tell you what, the, like by the time kind of Thursday practice ends, mm -hmm. it, it seems like an eternity. By the time you get to the game, you feel like you've been waiting forever. Like these guys, if anything, you got to guard against being too amped up because mm -hmm. you're so ready to go and you've been waiting forever and you feel great because you haven't played in a couple weeks. And so uh, that's one of the big challenges also, like early on in the game, don't get too amped up. And then also it's going to be the longest halftime of your life. So you're going to have to eat or drink something and stay so ready to go and you know regroup in the second half. And we've seen some games, right? Second half, a team comes out flat. They've been sitting around for half an hour. So stuff like we're longer, right? And stuff like that does matter. But it's a great experience, man. I'm so happy for him. He's been waiting for this moment for his whole life. And now he gets to take the field with his team and see what they can do. And we're happy for you. Dude. Thanks, guys. We're yeah, really thank happy you, for man. You. This is all time. Yeah. Great episode. We got to get the. Uh,